All right, the ghost extreme by Mefferts. Today, you are going to learn how to solve it. Uh, I'll break this up into a number of videos. I, I could probably, I mean, if you were if you were real experienced in these twisty puzzles, uh, you know, someone who's accustomed to doing it and can kind of see the math and the geometry from experience, even if you don't know this one, I could probably teach you how to do it in about 15, 20 minutes. It's not that difficult a solve. Um, I think altogether my toolkit for solving it involves um, nine, nine different sequences of moves. Um, all but two of them are uh, nine moves or less. Um, the last one, the finishing move that you almost always need to use is kind of a monster. It's a 16 move sequence to finish it off. Um, but uh, I'll take this at a measured pace because not everybody is going to be kind of a seasoned veteran with twisty puzzles. So uh, forgive me if, uh, uh, if I take it a little slow. But uh, here's the puzzle. And uh, I guess let's start scrambling up while I talk. This, um, <clears throat> this puzzle, before I start scrambling it up, it's got these uh, different axes of rotation. If you have played around with this, uh, if you've been curious enough to find this video in the first place, you've probably noticed that it has four axes of rotation. If you're like me, and as soon as you bust it out of the box, you don't really observe it in its solved state, you just take right to scrambling it. Um, you know, one thing you might not have noticed is that on those four axes of rotation, when it comes out of the box in its solved state, only one of those axes works. So grab this thing. Try and turn it on this right axis. It doesn't turn. Spin it. Try and turn it over here. It doesn't turn. Spin it. Try and turn it over here. It doesn't turn. The only axis that turns is this one. All right. Another thing about this puzzle. It's got these ball bearings inside. It clicks. Listen. You can hear it and you can feel it set in. And those are its natural positions. But look at those natural positions. It's not matched up. It's not solved. Click. Not matched up. Click. Not even close to matched up. The solved state, the last thing you'll do is you will put this thing in between two positions. And so what it means is in the normal states of rest of this puzzle, Every piece, not every piece, but most of the pieces are going to have a, an edge, a border that doesn't mate up to another piece because, you know, this last thing I do is kind of set it in between two positions. Um, so we got to be cognizant of that and we got to understand what we're trying to do. If you just start anywhere and try to solve outward from a particular place that you start, it's going to frustrate you because you're going to run into edges like this one where the mate, the pair for this thing just doesn't exist. You know, it, it's, if I slide it to the different set positions, it's not there. And so we got to understand that. So, um, so like I say, I'll just go ahead and start scrambling this thing up and you'll know, say a few words about it. Um, there are only 14 pieces on this puzzle. Uh, you know, compare that too. If I take, uh, if I take the standard, uh, three by three by three Rubik's cube. Uh, that's got 26 pieces and really 20 pieces. Um, if you consider that the centers can't move and the centers don't even count. So your standard Rubik's cube has 20 pieces and this only has 14. So uh, this is going to be a manageable solve, especially, um, you know, like I say, even if uh, you've never gone out into anything exotic or further than like a three by three Rubik's cube. Um, <clears throat> got, you know, it's got that going for it. Uh, other thing it's got going for it, it's got less moves than a Rubik's Cube, too. Um, this, there's really only eight possible moves from any position on this puzzle. We've got those four axes of rotation. Uh, but check this out. So, look here, I've got this, uh, T. Fisher, I guess that's the designer. It's written on the bottom here. So listen for the clicks and how many turns this thing has. Three. Only three positions compared to four on a Rubik's Cube. So even though the Rubik's Cube only has three axes of rotation, 
it's got three layers on each of those axes and on each of those axes it can stop in four different places so Rubik's Cube has a lot more possible moves uh, than this does this puzzle only has eight moves I'll never need to move twice in the same direction at the same time because if I want to spin this thing clockwise if I want to spin it clockwise again I'll just be where I would have been if I had only gone counterclockwise in the first place so our entire lexicon of moves in solving the ghost extreme is just going to be which one of those four axes am I rotating and am I rotating it clockwise or am I rotating it counterclockwise so two moves times four axes equals only eight possible moves all right I mentioned there are 14 pieces uh, I am going to refer to these pieces as square pieces and triangle pieces. And you might be looking at this and saying, well, that seems a little bit limiting because I see all kinds of shapes on here. I see various quadrilaterals and pentagons and hexagons and such. Um, you know, it's not all triangles and uh, squares. But what I'm talking about is not the shapes that you see on the surface. I'm talking about the solid polyhedron shapes of each individual piece. And so when I talk about square pieces and triangle pieces, what I mean is this. I'm going to tilt this on the side. Stay focused on this T. Fisher piece. So this piece, imagine a pyramid. Imagine a pyramid like you see on the pictures in Egypt. i got a pyramid, and the point is going up into the sky. But in this case, imagine the point is going in toward the center of the puzzle. This piece is in the shape of a pyramid. And I can see that pyramid has one, two, three sides. And these are the pieces I call the triangle pieces. Whether they have triangles up here or not, some of them have three triangles, some of them have one triangle, some of them have different shapes, but I call them triangle pieces if they are these three-sided pyramid polyhedron type pieces. There are eight of these triangle pieces. And note that these triangle pieces, each one of them orthogonally is next to a piece that's not a triangle piece. We'll talk about these other ones in a second. On the points, the points always link to another triangle piece, point to another triangle piece. Triangle piece, another triangle piece. Triangle piece, another triangle piece. Triangle piece, another triangle piece. All right, there are eight of these triangle pieces. What are the other six pieces? The other six pieces I call square pieces. And again, not because they show squares on their faces. And in fact, there isn't a single square on this entire puzzle. But I call them square pieces because of their polyhedron shape. And this is a good one, and I'll turn this sideways. And so if I think again about a pyramid with a point that extends into the center of the puzzle, here's one side, two sides of that pyramid, three sides of that pyramid, four sides of that pyramid. There are six of these square pieces. Each of these square pieces, their points meet at another square piece. So all the square pieces, all the triangle pieces, at their points, they point at another square piece or another triangle piece, respectively. On their edges, they go with opposites. A square is adjacent to a triangle triangle is adjacent to a square. A square is adjacent to a triangle. That's all it's, how all these pieces fit together. All right. <clears throat> On those four axes of rotation, what we are going to do is anytime I'm explaining a sequence of moves to you, and we won't do any in, uh, uh, in this video. We'll save that till the second video. But anytime I'm explaining a sequence of moves to you, we are going to be looking at the puzzle at one of the square pieces and we're going to be looking at it in a square orientation not a diamond with the sides diagonal but in a square orientation and here we can pretty clearly see these four axes that i'm talking about axes of rotation and that's why you know i set up all the moves it makes it easy to communicate the moves if we look at it like this i've got an axis that comes down vertically from the top around the right side of this piece. I've got another axis that, come, axis that comes down vertically from the top down the left side of this piece.
I've got an axis that goes across horizontally coming over the top of this piece. And I've got a fourth axis that comes through on the bottom. It's coming through horizontally, really across the middle, but below this piece that we're looking at. And so I've got notations for each of these. Now I'm right-handed, and I'm going to have the letter go with a clockwise rotation of whatever hand I'm grabbing it with. If I'm grabbing on the right, if I'm grabbing on the top, if I'm grabbing on the bottom, I'm going to be grabbing with my right. Now, I'm right-handed, but I'm not plastic man, so if I'm turning the pieces on the left, I'm going to grab with my left hand. But in each case, the notation for the moves is going to take, you know, whichever side of the puzzle I'm grabbing, and I'll use that, and then that letter will signify the clockwise rotation. That letter with a prime, with an apostrophe, is going to indicate a counterclockwise rotation. So if I grab this piece with my right hand and rotate the pieces to the right going in a clockwise manner. That's an R. R for right. R. R. I'm turning clockwise and I see the pieces moving from bottom to top as I'm looking at it. If I go R prime, R prime, R prime. Still grabbing with the right. R for right. Turning counterclockwise and I see the pieces moving top to bottom. Now, if I grab on the left, and I apologize if this causes any confusion, because I know if I grab on the left, this way is counterclockwise, and this way is clockwise. Uh, however, it's just uh, something about the human body, or mind anyway, that with wrists, you know, this motion is just more natural than this motion coming back. So, um, I know it's counterclockwise, but my L is going to be the counterclockwise motion, the sort of more natural wrist motion. So, again, I apologize if it's inconsistent. It's the way I've set the whole thing up. It's the way it's easiest for me to think it through. But it's going to be an L is a counterclockwise move. It's the one that moves the pieces on the side. You see them going up from bottom to top. That's the L move. And then the L prime is going to be the clockwise move that brings it back the other way. L prime, L prime, pieces moving from bottom to top. Uh, I'd love to go U for upper and L for lower here, but I don't want to get lower confused with left. So instead, for my other two axes, I'm going to call them top and bottom. If I grab with my right hand on the top and spin in a clockwise direction, what I'm going to see is pieces moving from right to left. T, T. If I'm grabbing with my right hand on the top and turning in a counterclockwise direction, I'll see pieces moving left to right. T prime, T prime, T prime. And finally on the bottom. I'm going to go across this axis on the bottom, grab with my right hand, and if I'm spinning in a clockwise direction, I'll see the pieces moving left to right. B for bottom, B, B, moving clockwise. If I grab with my right hand on the bottom and I'm spinning in a counterclockwise fashion, I'll see the pieces moving right to left. B prime, B prime, B prime. Those are the eight moves, and those are the things we're going to need to make the magic happen. Uh, next video, we will introduce some important pieces that are going to get us going. Uh, if uh, you got any questions, anything unclear, uh, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, if you like it, uh, go ahead and uh, do the old like and subscribe, and uh, uh, we'll see you in the second video.